Uh, our final speaker this evening is uh, John Longworth, uh, and uh, John is much in demand. In fact, during the course of this evening, he had to uh, steal away and do an interview with Adam Bolton on Sky. Uh, so really, I walked out past the bar, and there he was on the monitors in the bar, uh, appearing on Sky. So the piece of good news is, he's running on time, he hasn't pulled up in their green room somewhere, uh, and he's back in the room, so we uh, can progress. Now, as you undoubtedly know, um, John was the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce until he was suspended, uh, and then resigned after backing Brexit on live television. <laughs> Can they do it, do it big? <laughs> I commend you for that. Uh, John is now a campaign committee member of Vote Leave uh, and chairman of their business council. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, as I say, as much in demand, John Holmes. John. Um, I've done uh, events at the, this august institution of the Institute of Economic Affairs previously, so I know the, uh, the very best thing to do right at the beginning of any presentation is to get your um, sort of mitigation in first. I ought to say, first of all, that I am not an economist and I am not a politician. I'm just a mere businessman. So anything I say should be taken in that context. Um, I'm also going to say that the uh, normal course of debate, of course, is to rebut the previous speaker. But I'm not going to waste my breath doing that, because everything he said is absolutely rebuttable. And if you want to see me afterwards, I'll do it. Uh, so I'm sure many people in the room realise that. I also feel the weight of responsibility, since most people are Brexiteers in the room, because I can only make it worse. <laughs> um, so, um, Secondly, I would say that actually the, I'm going to, in the very British fashion, stick to the brief and talk about the, uh, what, the, what the debate was actually set out to be, which is, uh, should supporters of free market support rates continue membership of the EU? I found it a fiendishly difficult question, actually, um, because I immediately started to ask a number of questions of myself. So, for example, uh, how do you define market? Uh, for example, is it geographic? Is it the UK market, the EU market, or the global market we're talking about? How do, you, how do you define free? For example, is it free of impediments? Is it free of market abuse or distortion? Free of concentration? Free of market failure? Or in the case of the two leaders of state in the EU, free of evidence? How do we measure the free market? Through its purpose? Is it there to enrich a few, to do intrinsic good for the betterment of mankind, to provide most efficient use of resources? What is the free market for? And cap you know, capitalism, I think the IEA will probably uh, say, uh, I've heard it said certainly around IEA tables, capitalism is widely regarded as the best means we have of efficient allocation of resources. But there are many forms of capitalism, and free market capitalism is only one of them. So I've been asking these questions, which now is left with only seven and a half minutes, which is quite useful, um, to illustrate that I've, uh, what I've gleaned from this is that the best I can do is to set out a couple of examples, a couple of areas, as to why, if you're in your right minds, you should vote to leave the European Union if you want to support free markets. Firstly, the single market and trade. The European single market has not been good for Britain because it's not designed for us. The European single market was designed for French agriculture and German goods. The UK is predominantly a service sector economy, by and large. There is no single market in services in the European Union to speak of, other than wholesale banking and an attempt which has so far not succeeded in e-commerce, there is no single market for our activity in the European Union, and there is no appetite in, the, in Brussels to create one either, because I was asking those very questions <coughs> in the latter part of last year. So it is not a good market for the UK. The second thing is that the goods market itself in the European Union is unraveling. The Director General for Internal Market told me in November that they were receiving over 1,000 notifications a year, three a day on average, 
of laws being introduced by member states of the European Union, not just club men, which were impediments to the free movement of goods in Europe. They were unable to deal with this because the most they could do was write a stern letter. And no member of the European Union, including the UK, had been prepared to actually nominate an authority to enforce single market rules. So even the market in goods is unraveling for Europe itself. Actually, of course, as Delors reminded us, the European single market is not really a reality. It is simply a vehicle for a political project. The regulation burdens of the European single market are a drag anchor on our economy. In 2010, the British Chambers of Commerce produced a report indicating that European legislation thus far had cost the UK economy £80 billion pounds a year. That was their estimate. Some of that, of course, is domestic driven and will probably remain, but a substantial proportion was driven by the EU. They stopped counting in 2010, that's before my time, by the way, because nobody was listening. And since then, we've had major European legislation introduced, which we know has cost billions of pounds. The very things like the standards regulations on things like noise, which apply to exports, apply to any exports to anywhere in the world. If we want to export to Japan or the United States, we have to comply with Japanese or United States standards. We don't have to apply those standards to the 95% of businesses in the UK who do not export. We do not have to apply those standards to the 80% uh, of the UK economy that is not related to exports. Only 13% of the UK economy is directly related to exports to Europe. And I know there are plenty of businesses up and down the country who uh, operate purely domestically or export only to the rest of the world who are desperate to leave the EU because it makes them uncompetitive in the world market. And then there are those that say we should adopt the European way. We should actually cheat the way in which other countries do. But the very reason people invest in the UK is that we have the rule of law, that we have the consistency and certainty of the common law and case law, that we have actually got some certainty, which is why we have so much human investment and why London, one of the reasons why London is the financial center, the biggest financial center in the world. That will not stop when we leave the European Union. It will stop if we adopt the ways of our European partners. That is the way of corruption and arbitrary decision making by officials and politicians who can use the law to make decisions one way or another. And then there's the EU relative economic performance. The EU economy has shrunk dramatically in the last 30 years relative to the rest of the world. This is an indicator of the fact that Europe is unproductive, overregulated, and has not got a free market operating within the single market. And also, Britain's benefited the least from exports, the least from trade deals. Do you know the European Union combined the whole of the European Union's trade deals are actually with economies whose combined, uh, combined GDP is far less than the trade deals that Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, South Korea and other small states like Chile have been able to achieve. They have deals with China, Hong Kong and Canada. The EU does not. The EU has deals with small countries around the world. We are prevented from making those trade deals. The Australian High Commissioner told me only a few weeks before I resigned from the British Chambers that Australia would do a trade deal with the UK in the blink of an eye. This was repeated by the Indian High Commissioner, by the Canadian High Commissioner. These are deals that we can easily do ourselves. The Civitas report that was produced recently indicated that since the single market has been created, Britain has actually lost out the main beneficiaries of the European single market have been third country companies, companies from Japan, the United States, etc., not even Germany. And we have been the least beneficiaries of those trade deals and the single market. 
The second area I'll just cover very briefly is the area I've been talking to Adam Bolton about a moment ago, which is steel. Steel in the foundation industries. I saw in Parliament 10 days ago the Institute of Public Policy Research, and I'd love to mention them here, <laughs> produce, produce a report on behalf of the foundation industries. It was actually sponsored by Tartar, so I'm assuming it actually had their support. A report on the remedies for the problems of steel. And it's not just steel, because it's steel today, it's basic chemicals tomorrow, wood, produce, wood basics the, 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 the day after, and then it'll be other metals. They're all in the same perilous position, all strategically important for the UK, and all fundamentally important to a manufacturing sector. Two minutes, please. This report sets out a number of remedies. Three quarters of those remedies are blocked by the European Union. The Germans put 29 billion euros into the foundation industries last year through the state-backed German business bank, the KfW. The Treasury and bids have consistently said we're not allowed to do that because of state aid rules, simply because the Germans set that state-backed business bank up. Actually, we did for German reconstruction after World War II, and the French had got one, and the Italians had got one. We set it up before the Treaty of Rome was signed. So they're free of state aid rules. So we have unfair competition within the EU on products like steel, which is subsidised. We can't apply the 266% tariff the US applied to steel imports dumping because of a distorted and failed market globally. This is not about free markets, this is about adjusting markets to stop market failure. We can't use public procurement. We have oodles of requirements for steel, for HS3, HS2, Crossrail, etc. And we can't specify that it should be sourced from British steel, even though it would cost us more to have those guys unemployed. And energy policy in the EU has been a disaster. Energy prices have been going up in the European Union, while energy prices in the rest of the world and the US have been going down. Disastrous for our energy industries. Because the European Union thought oil and gas were going to run out. How wrong is that? I, as I said to Adam Bolton, I really think that our government is locked into the matrix. They cannot see an alternative reality. And our Prime Minister, otherwise known as Agent Smith, tends to send out the forces of darkness should anybody, anybody have the temerity to show them that there is actually a real world out there. Thank you.